everybody, and welcome to the eAcademy, bringing balance to the meter, net metering policies and the impact on consumers. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. I know everyone's very busy, and we appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to, to join um, our eAcademy. My name is Rebecca Fitzgerald, and I'm the Program Manager of Energy and Environmental Policy for the Council of State Governments. And today we're going to focus on the increasing popularity of small-scale on-site power sources, also known as distributed generation. Uh, most small-scale distributed generation comes in the form of rooftop solar, which has been surging in large part due to policies uh, like net metering um, within the state. And uh, this, this increased use of distributed energy is transforming the way electricity is generated, transmitted, and distributed. And you can expect uh, in 2015 state lawmakers will continue the debates about the most appropriate way to balance consumer demand for distributed energy and uh, just, uh, generation while at the same time recognizing the real and substantial fixed and variable costs incurred um, by the electric utilities and what that potential impact may be for non-solar consumers. So today uh, we have got two panelists who will share their thoughts on how to balance the uh, the challenges and opportunities, and um, and also how to uh, address the consumer concerns. So a few quick logistics before I introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, you all are in listen-only mode, um, but we do encourage you uh, to submit questions. And there's a little bit of there's a box on the side of your screen that you can do that in. You just write them out, and if you have a particular speaker um, that you would like that to go to, you can uh, indicate that in, in your question. Um, if you're having any difficulties um, with technical difficulties, just uh, let us know as well over that, and uh, we'll work on getting that fixed for you all. Um, so without any further ado, we want to welcome our panelists, and we're very fortunate to have them join us and give, them a, give us a bit of their time. Um, our first uh, panelist will be David Owens. Mr. Owens is the Executive Vice President of Business Operations at Edison Electric Institute, the association that represents all U.S. investor-owned electric companies. And in uh, his role, he has significant responsibility over a broad range of issues that affect the future structure of the electric industry and new rules and involving uh, competitive markets. Mr. Owens also spearheads the efforts to enhance the public policy climate for investments in American's electric infrastructure, or electricity infrastructure, uh, with an emphasis on the role of new technologies to address climate change. Um, and so, welcome, Mr. Owens. And uh, I'll introduce our second speaker, and then I'll hand it over to Mr. Owens. But our second panelist uh, is uh, Sherry Givens. Ms. Givens serves as president of Givens Consulting in Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, it's a firm provi or focused on providing energy consulting services, policy research, and analysis. She also serves as policy director for uh, Power Across Texas. Uh, given previously led the Texas Office of the Public Utility Council, the state's utility consumer advocacy agency for residential and small business utility consumers. She served on both the electric Reliability Council of Texas and the Texas Reliability Entities Board of Directors as an ex officio member representing residential consumers. So again, thank you, uh, panelists, for joining us. And I will hand it over to uh, Mr. Owens to begin his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with all of you. I know you all have pretty demanding schedules, so it's a special treat to have you join us today. Uh, I'm going to uh, do the fundamentals of net metering and distributive generation. If we can go to the next slide. But to do that, I need to put uh, the issue of electricity in a context. If you look carefully at this slide, which shows, this, shows changes in electricity prices compared to other consumer products, you will note for the period 1991 through 2013, we actually are getting a pretty good deal uh, in terms of our electricity bills. In fact, if you look very carefully at this, you'll see that even, uh, even the consumer price index is higher than what uh, the changes in electricity prices have been. So consumers are getting a pretty good deal. There's tremendous value in electricity. Let me try to just give you a snapshot to illustrate that value, because I think it's important as we talk about distributed generation. If we could go to the next slide. 
So we now spend about four times more on electric applications than we do on our electric bills. I know if you if you surveyed your house, your home, you would probably uh, conclude that you have at least 20 plug-in devices, devices that use electricity. Our landline, uh, our cellular phones, our personal computers, our television, a broad range of household appliances that we have. They all are plug-in elements. We spend more on those elements than we do on our electric bill. Let's go to the next slide. So traditionally, we're in a period where our electric distribution system is in transition. What that means is that the wires that go into your homes and your businesses, we call that our distribution system. And today, what is occurring is that we now have distributed energy resources including distributed generation. I'll explain what that is in a minute. That are giving customers a broad array of choices. Where, so we're so heavily dependent on electricity, some customers want to be able to produce their own electricity. We also know, too, that we have smart infrastructures that are going, that we're depending on today. We all have smart phones. We have smart electric meters. We have, in fact, throughout the United States, over over 40 million uh, smart electric meters. You now can monitor how much uh, electricity you're using uh, by just separating the digital numbers and very easily see. So we have a very different electric system that's beginning to evolve that's giving customers choice. Let's go to the next slide. So one of those choices are distributed generation. So what are distributed generation systems? Well, they're small-scale, on-site power generation. They're located at or near a customer's home or business. Now, let's talk about a few examples. Rooftop solar, that's a distributed generation source. Energy storage devices, that's a distributed generation source. Fuel cells, micro turbines, small wind turbines, combined heat and power, and even a plug-in electric vehicle itself is also a distributed uh, generating source. All of these sources are beginning to evolve on the electric grid. So the electric grid, rather than be a transporter primarily of energy from the utility, we now have the customer producing energy and selling that energy back to the utility. Let's go to the next slide. So the system that I grew up with in was a, is a system that basically said the utility produced electricity from different types of generation, solar, wind, nuclear, coal fire plants. And that electricity flowed across the grid, and it was converted. And then ultimately, it went to the customer, uh, and it served all the needs of commercial customers, industrial customers and residential customers. The grid that we're talking about today and the one that's evolving in the future is one that looks at millions of technologies now that are attached to that distribution grid. Millions of, of resources, distributed resources that attach to that distribution system. So we're looking now looking at a system that doesn't have one-way flow of electricity, we're looking at a system that had multi-directional flow of electricity. And that's very, very unique and it's very exciting. Another way to say it is we're moving from a centralized system to an increasingly distributed uh, electricity grid. Let's go to the next slide. So this grid that we're looking at today is a multi-directional network interconnecting millions of intelligent consuming devices. It's interconnecting flexible distributive energy resources, including DG, and backup generation. Another way to say it is this grid is really an enabler of emerging technologies. 
Now, operating such a grid in the future is going to be much more complex than what it was historically. It's going to require the electric company to know at all times what the consumer is doing. If the consumer is producing their own energy, the utility needs to be knowledgeable of that to keep the lights on. It means that the utility is going to have to collaborate increasingly with customers, residential customers, commercial customers, and industrial customers. It also means that there are other suppliers of customer needs, rooftop solar companies. So it means that utilities will have to engage in a collaboration, in a partnership with those new energy services providers. So the grid is becoming, rather than one-way road, it's becoming the grid of things. Let's go to the next slide. Now I conclude that by looking at research that has been done. I look at research done by the Department of Energy, research done by McKinsey, research done by uh, think tank groups, other think tank groups. And they all are concluding that increasingly as we move past 2020, that we may in fact see greater penetration of distributive resources. Greater use of demand response. Some customers will make the decision rather than use electricity at the highest and hottest port of the day, let me reduce my consumption be paid by the utility. I already mentioned rooftop solar, uh, backup generation. All of these are elements now that we call distributive in nature, and they change the overall way that we operate the grid. So technologies are driving a lot of what is occurring. Let's go to the next slide. but so are public policies. We have 29 states in the District of Columbia that have set renewable portfolio standards, mandatory standards for utilities to meet. Let me say it differently. Many state PUCs and their legislatures are saying, we want a certain amount of your supply to be renewables, and we want you to achieve that by a date certain. Then there's other policies that are stimulating the development of distributive energy resources. One of those are net metering policies at the state level. We'll explain what net metering is in a minute. But let's go to the next slide. So let's look at one type of renewable. Let's look at solar energy. So there are different types of ways to produce solar energy. You can have rooftop solar, which is evolving very significantly throughout the United States, particularly in states like Arizona, Hawaii, and California. You can have a community-based solar facility where you could have something on, a, on, a, on an army base, on a, on, a, uh, on a military base, or a university where they have a centralized facility that serves the campus. We all call that community-based solar. Or you can have the utility building a major solar facility so it serves all customers. Obviously, the most significant investment in solar is by the utility industry. And this chart illustrates that more than triple the amount of solar that's been provided for rooftop is utility scale solar. So you can see the relative amounts of additions that have occurred. There are also cost differentials. Rooftop solar generally is $3 to $4 a cell uh, per watt. A utility scale solar facility is $1.77. So you can see that utility scale solar is far more cost effective, but it also has a greater power density. These are the kinds of choices that we're dealing with today. Next slide. It's also fair to say that the cost of PV is coming down very, very significantly. The technology is improving. The density of the technology is improving substantially. Many customers want the option to have their own power supply or rooftop solar. 
So that's leading a lot to the changes that are taking place. In addition, the evolution of smart technologies, as well as customers are increasingly concerned about reliability. Frequencies of storms have suggested to customers that they need to have their own portable generator so that they are not interrupted if we have a major storm. And then our Department of Defense has goals that have been set by the administration to essentially move increasingly towards becoming self-reliant, having their own what we call microgrid and their own power supply, even though they're still connected to the utility. So my point is there, there are a lot of technologies that are pushing the movement towards more distributed technologies. There are a lot of public policies that are equally uh, pushing these technologies. Next slide. And what that means is that the grid has got to be smarter. The grid has got to be much more resilient. The grid has got to be able to take all of this information and digest it. So it requires us to make major new investments in modernizing the electric grid. So today, the private sector is spending roughly 20 to $23 billion annually in investment in the grid and making the grid so it's smarter, so it's much more resilient, and so it can accommodate the evolution of a broad range of new technologies. In other words, the grid is now the enabler of many technologies. Let's go to the next slide. So this slide shows a customer that has a a, uh, a solar cells on their roof. And if you look at the slide very carefully, the green area indicates the energy that the utility provides, the power supply that the utility provides. You will note that the green area is there 24 hours out of the day. The blue area represents the energy produced from the solar cells on a customer's roof. You will note that that's available roughly 12 hours a day. You also note that there is a period of the day where there is more energy produced from the solar facility than what the customer needs. So the customer sells that energy back to the electricity grid. You'll also note that in the evening hours, the customer relies on the utility and buys energy from the grid. In the early morning hours, the customer relies on the utility and buys energy from the grid. So remember what I said that the grid now is a multi-directional grid? This really illustrates it. It shows that there's a period of the day where the customer depends exclusively on the utility and the grid. Then it shows a period of the day where the customer uses the grid to sell their excess power back to the utility. So looking at this graph more carefully, let me try to define net energy metering for you just by looking at this graph, and then we'll get into it in a little bit more detail. When the customer buys from the utility grid, the customer pays the retail electric rate. When the customer sells back to the utility grid, the question becomes, should the utility pay the customer the retail rate? In other words, if the utility sells electricity to the customer at $0.10, cents, should the utility buy electricity from the customer at $0.10? Cents? Now, those who argue that the utility should pay $0.10 cents really, in my view, are saying that they believe that the customer's rooftop solar is equivalent to the wires, to the meters, to the backup generators, to the entire grid system that the utility has. Nothing could be further from the truth. So let's go to the next slide, try to illustrate this a little bit more. When a utility sells energy to the customer, we do it, and the customer gets a bill. And generally that bill has two major components. It has a fixed component for the infrastructure, and it has a variable component for the fuel. Now, net energy metering, if I pay the customer $0.10, cents, for the energy thereby, it means that customer is not making any contribution towards the grid costs. It means that customer is not making any contribution towards the infrastructure that's necessary 
to let that energy flow and to let the customer sell energy back to the utility. Net energy metering, when it's done improperly, says you pay 10 cents, you pay the customer the same rate that you charge the customer. Let's go to the next slide and let me try to illustrate this a little bit better. This slide shows a typical residential bill. It shows that the customer has average monthly usage of a thousand kilowatt hours a month and it has an average monthly bill of $110. Another way to say it is the customer pays 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Now let's look at unbundling this bill. Let's look at the fixed components of that bill. Let's look at the infrastructure. Now there are two parts of that infrastructure. There are the power plants and then there's the wires business. If you look at the wires part, that's called transmission, which is $10. It's called distribution services, which is $30. And then you also know that you have that backup generation, and that's $19. But just looking at the wires component, you see that $40 out of that $110 bill is for the wires. And $19 is for the generating capacity. Another way to say it is almost 55% of that bill is tied to fixed costs. 40% of that bill is tied to the grid. The other portion is tied, of fixed costs is tied to the power supply. And that's what concerns us. And that's really where the fallacy of net energy metering policies, and that's why they need to be reformed. Because if the customer does not pay that portion, the rooftop solar customer does not pay the fixed charges, then it means that other customers have to pick up that slack. Let's go to the next slide. Another way to say it is that those costs that are not paid for by the rooftop solar customer, those costs associated with that grid that permits them to buy and sell electricity, if they are not contributing to those costs, those costs are there. It means that those costs will be shifted to non-DG customers. That's why I believe very strongly that we need to reform our net metering policies that compensate the DG customer at the retail rate. Many state commissioners, many state legislatures are seriously addressing this matter. It's been an issue before the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners who have adopted various resolutions to begin to address this issue. Why am I worried about this issue? Let's go to the next slide. I'm worried about this issue because I'm familiar with what's occurring in Germany. Let's go to the next slide. In Germany, they have tremendous subsidies that are occurring. There was a policy goal by the government to stimulate the development of rooftop solar facilities. There were very generous what we call feed-in tariffs that paid substantial dollars to the customer and gave them many incentives put, to put on rooftop solar. Let's go to the next slide. The rooftop solar transactions have had an impact on the electricity markets to the point where the prices in those markets have plunged. Very, very significant. I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, well, what does that have to do with electricity bills? Let's go to the next slide. Because of these huge subsidies, because of this substantial increase in rooftop solar facilities, the average electricity rate in Germany has doubled. It used to be 19 cents per kilowatt hour. Now it's 39 cents per kilowatt hour. And in some areas, it's much worse. Next slide. In addition, the goal, among others, of the German government was to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint. 
But we know that renewable technologies, and I showed you that from the graph, particularly rooftop solar, is not available 24-7. It's very weather dependent. So it means in those periods where you can't depend on rooftop solar, you have to look at other power supply sources. Well, Germany decided as well to shut down their nuclear plants, which are zero emitting, uh, zero carbon emitting resources. So what has happened in Germany is it means that they've had to rely on other types of power supply. And many of those power supply are coal plants. So the reliability has been adversely impacted in Germany. The prices have doubled and the carbon footprint has substantially increased. We think that we can learn some valuable lessons from Germany as we begin to stimulate the development, particular of rooftop solar that we need to make sure we have the right policies. Particularly, we need to make sure that net energy metering policies are refined. Let's go to the last slide. Next slide. So my fundamental message to you, among others, is that the electric grid delivers a valuable product essential to all Americans. I showed you all the plug-in devices that we have, how electricity prices have been very competitive, and the grid is essential to that. I mentioned as well that the grid is being transformed from a one-way system to a multi-directional system, and that it requires investment to make the grid so that it can be more flexible and resilient to meet the growing demands of our digital society. I also believe very strongly that everyone who uses the grid should help pay to maintain it and to keep it operating reliable. And then finally, that our nation, it's very important for us to remain our competitiveness that we have a diverse supply of safe, reliable electricity and electricity rates that are fair and affordable for all customers. I appreciate your time and attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, David, and uh, that was very informative. And so we look forward to uh, the next piece, uh, Ms. Sherry uh, Givens, and she's going to uh, speak a little bit on the impacts on consumers related to uh, net metering policy. Thanks, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate uh, CSG's invitation to speak to you today, and I appreciate all the state officials and staff that are taking the time to join us. I'm going to talk about three main issues today. Next slide, please. And those are going to be consumer groups, consumer education, and consumer protection. As Rebecca said, I'm the former state consumer advocate for the state of Texas. So these are areas that I'm very familiar with. Um, I have actually been researching this issue and speaking on it for the past year, kind of providing the consumer perspective about distributed generation, specifically rooftop solar. I think these are important issues for you to think about and deliberate in these upcoming legislative sessions. Um, they're important to your constituents, and they should be important to you as well. Next slide, please. First off, consumer groups. I want to talk to you today about NASUCA. Um, it might be a group that you're not very familiar with. Uh, it is the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates. Just like NARUF, the National Association of Regulatory Utility, Con Regulatory Utility Commission, as an organization at the national level that all of the uh, utility commissions are members of. Likewise, the consumer advocates that each of the states are members of this organization. These are typically um, independent standalone agencies. They might be divisions within attorney general's offices. They might even be divisions within public service commissions or public utility commissions. They could be nonprofits within your state. They act independently. They intervene in rate proceedings and rulemaking. They even most of them have the ability to recommend legislation. Uh, when I was the head of my state agency, I was often brought bills by the legislature, uh, bills that were drafted by utilities or other third parties related to energy. And I was asked for my independent third party judgment on those bills as they related to the constituents in their service territory. Um, these folks represent your constituency. They are representing the homeowners and the business owners. So these would be a good, good group for you to get to know and, and understand if they operate in your state. Uh, to find out more, you can go to nasuka.org. They're one of the few consumer groups that has gone and weighed in on the DG issue. Most recently, at their annual meeting in San Francisco in November, they passed a 
distributed generation resolution. They recognize that there are many deceptive practices that are going on in the DG community, especially as it relates to leases of rooftop solar. And they really want to promote uh, education, full and fair protection, and marketplace standards. I provided a hyperlink in this document with many um, different resources for you to utilize. So if you get a copy of this presentation, please go to those. A couple of other groups you might not be familiar with, um, NCLC, the National Consumer Law Center, they advocate for low-income consumers. Of course, everyone's familiar with Consumer Reports. They have their policy branch of Consumers Union, AERP representing the seniors. Each of these groups typically have um, a state representative, sometimes a local representative. And in your state, I'm sure there are a number of state or specific consumer advocate organizations that represent anywhere from environmental to low-income seniors and the like. I encourage you to reach out to them if there is a particular issue, especially if it relates to energy or distributed generation, to see if they have an opinion or if their uh, membership has voiced any uh, decision on this issue. Next slide. The second area I want to focus on today is consumer education. And specifically, I want to talk about rooftop solar. There's a lot of costs and benefits that are associated with residential rooftop solar, especially if you're looking at leasing or purchasing rooftop solar. But one important thing is, is that neither of these options is off the grid, so to speak. These people are still connected 24-7 with their rooftop panel. You know, if, if it's nighttime or if it's cloudy, you know, they're still going to need to access the grid. And they're still going to have to access utility services. Um, perhaps their you know, solar panels are not actually producing as much as their home needs. They're going to still need to access the grid. And I think David gave a really good overview of the many different uh, resources that the electric grid provides from a distribution standpoint and from this continuous service to meet the variability of the solar rooftop needs. When people are actually entering contracts where there is a purchase or a lease of solar rooftop, there are several things that are associated with it that not all consumers are aware of, and they need to be more informed about it. Um, as I said, I've been researching this issue for the past year. There's, there's just not a lot of good independent third-party resources available um, related to this. Uh, whenever a solar uh, leasing company or a sales company goes to an individual to uh, actually sell their product or lease their product, they typically report that electricity prices are on the rise, up to 5% per year. Um, but some jurisdictions, and you probably know your energy utility best, might not have had a rate increase for the past 10 to 15 years. They may have only seen an increase of 1% five percent per year, or 1% to 2% per year. And it's another issue is the projected savings that these sellers and leasers are providing to the customers that they're signing up. These are large investments for people. They can be anywhere from $5,000 up to $50,000. If it's a lease, it's a 20-year lease. Um, within the provisions of the contract, and I highly encourage you to get a copy of a solar lease scan. Um, they're very hard to find. Uh, Google does not provide a lot of solar leases on, uh, on the web, so, but if you can get a copy, I encourage you to read it. Um, you practically have to be an attorney or a CPA to understand some of the fine print in that. Uh, one of the areas that I want to point to your attention is annual price escalators. So going back to that if the electricity prices do not increase the supported 5%, 4% per year, if they, if they stay level, if they only increase 1% to 2%, it doesn't matter because a lot of these contracts provide for an annual price escalator, anywhere from 2 to 4% per year. So the, the solar rooftop panels might actually be paying more for solar than they would if they had just been paying their normal electric bill. There's other considerations to think about um, whenever the person wants to sell their home and they have the rooftop solar panels. They might actually have to either purchase the panels outright and, and actually include that within the sale of their home. Um, their purchaser might have to meet certain credit score requirements to purchase the home if, the, if you're not willing to actually uh, purchase the contract outright. So a lot of these things aren't very clear and they're not very uh, bold safe type for people to understand what's going on. Again, with leases, there are a lot of tax credits and rebates out there. There's a really good website, and I'll get into that on the consumer education resources. They talked about each state's um, different uh, rebates and tax credits. There could be local, there could be utility, there could be manufacturer rebates, and, and there's also a 30% uh, federal tax incentive as well that's available. But those aren't going to the homeowner. Those are actually going to the leasing company. Uh, warranties and homeowner responsibility, this could be a laundry list of things that your homeowner, you really need to pay attention to. There's a lot of operation and maintenance involved. Um, there's 
anywhere from cleaning the solar panels, it could be snow related, it could be dust related, uh, trimming trees or any kind of structures that block the rooftop panels, we could be responsible for that. And then in the contract options, a lot of these solar leases don't provide an opportunity for people to actually purchase solar panels outright. They can either review them, upgrade them, or remove them, but they typically can't purchase them. And after paying $50,000 for something, I think it's like a component. It's not like a car lease. It's very, very simple. Net metering, again, I think David covered this. 43 states in D.C. where it credits the residential TV customers with a retail rate. Again, David covered this. You have the slide that actually I want to emphasize that slide number 16 that David showed is the U.S. Energy Information Administration's data. That's not EEI data. That's EIA data. It shows that it could be anywhere from 50 to 60 percent is the fixed cost of every electric customer bill. And it's becoming more and more apparent as the debate wakes on that residential customers with TV aren't necessarily paying their fair share. And you're going to hear uh, regressive and uh, Fairness to low income consumers and other consumers in your district. Carrie? But, yes. It's Rebecca. Sorry to interrupt you. I, you're just getting uh, quieter. Um, can um, you speak up just a tad? Sure. Sure. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. So, yeah, no problem. Um, so I just want you to be aware that these are um, issues that are being debated nationwide, uh, the cost shifting issue, whether or not uh, CG customers are paying their fair share. Next slide, please. On consumer education resources, again, I provided um, some websites for you. The DOE has a database for state renewables and efficiency or the desire database. That's going to show you all of the federal, state, local, some utility, some manufacturer um, incentives and rebates as well. NREL, the National Renewable Electric Laboratory, has a PV watt calculator, which is a great resource for those people that are interested in purchasing or leasing solar panels. It's a free online calculator that helps you determine um, actually how much solar panels might produce on your home and any kind of cost savings that you might generate in your state specifically. Some of the states are providing a little bit more consumer education as it relates to um, solar, um, some of the utility commissions specifically, Washington State, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into consumer protection. Um, they have a policy statement out there right now which is seeking a little bit more legislative guidance. Consumer Advocate Offices, uh, just yesterday, the Arizona Residential Utility Consumer Advocate Office uh, issued a checklist for those that were interested in purchasing or leasing solar panels. Some of the attorney generals are actually putting out publications and information. Um, Arizona issued a fraud alert. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit more in the consumer protection section. Some of the utilities are putting out one-pagers and checklists for consumers in their service territories to ensure that they have their uh, solar panels properly installed. Um, educational institutions are putting out literature right now. Uh, Louisiana State University's Ag Center is actually going to be putting out a consumer guide, I believe mid-February. That is a very expansive, extensive list of issues and things for people to think about before they purchase rooftop solar. It's my understanding it's going to have some tear-out one-pagers for people whenever they go shopping or whenever they go talk to leasing or, or sales providers as well. The Better Business Bureau also has uh, consumer news uh, information, any kind of fraud alert, and they also have a pretty good uh, database of complaints. So if there's a particular uh, purveyor of solar products in your um, service territory or in your state or county, then you can look them up by their name and see what kind of complaints have been filed. Next slide, please. Now, on the consumer protection angle, there are a lot of different complaints out there, ranging anywhere from harassing sales taxes, tax picks, deceptive advertising, overestimation of bill saving, people not receiving the written copies of their contract, any kind of undisclosed or extra fees are getting charged, um, contractors who are installing the solar panels without a license. This has actually been an issue in Louisiana, and there's been litigation involved in that. Uh, folks not completing the solar installation prod project. Um, Solar installers not informing the utility even that they have in, actually put um, solar panels on the consumer's home and the utility not knowing that they were actually um, available to receive net metered rates. Um, now where these complaints are being filed, that's probably going to surprise you. These people are not going to the Public Utility Commission, the Attorney General, or the Consumer Advocates. They're mostly going, again, to the Better Business Bureau, even Yelp.com and a website, ripoffreport.com. That's where folks are complaining about different 
uh, leasing providers, installers, and sales providers of solar. Now, some states have taken action. Just this past year, uh, Washington, as I mentioned, their uh, Utility Transportation Commission released an interpretive statement. Uh, they believe that they have jurisdiction over third-party solar leasing companies, but before they actually make that statement forthright, they're asking for uh, clarification from their state legislature. So this might be an issue that you'll see in your state in this upcoming session. In Louisiana, a bill was passed last session that actually uh, prohibits the leasing company from applying for any sales tax credits. Uh, in, in Louisiana, uh, companies can actually get up to 50 percent credit on any kind of solar installation they do, in, in, in addition to the 30 percent they're really receiving on the federal tax credit. And again, in Arizona, there was a consumer alert that was issued last year regarding third-party solar leasing company fraud. And then just a few months ago, uh, on the federal side, there was a bipartisan congressional letter that was signed by 12 members of Congress, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, regarding solar leasing companies, expressing concerns that their constituents were potentially um, being uh, subject to deceptive sales taxes from, from third-party leasing companies. And this letter was sent to the Federal Trade Commission and the, the newly formed Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, asking them to investigate it. Um, my final slide, please. So just in conclusion, um, from an education standpoint, uh, there's not a lot of resources out there, unfortunately, but more and more are becoming available. It's important for consumers to do their research, to know before they purchase or lease rooftop solar, what the different warranties are, what the different uh, provisions are uh, pertaining to their rooftop solar. And on the protection standpoint, I'm happy to say that some states are taking proactive action, either legislatively or, like I said, through interpretive statements. And I think the consumers are going to need to have one or more clearinghouses to go to to actually enforce some of their contract provisions or to file a complaint that can uh, result in an investigation of their installer, leaser, or sales company. And from a collaboration standpoint, I think it's important for policymakers, legislators, regulators, advocates, and utilities to work together in the coming years. We're going to see more and more DG and DER come online, and these are all important for a diverse fuel mix, but we really need to ensure that the rates continue to be affordable, reliable, and fair to all consumers. With that, um, that concludes my remarks, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry. And uh, um, we do have a few questions here, uh, and please feel free. Um, we've got about uh, 15 minutes or so to take questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to um, write those in the, the, our, uh, the box there on the side. Um, uh, the first question, um, can uh, either of you uh, address the benefits that uh, G DG provides the grid um, and perhaps address also the need um, for additional generation and transmission capacity? Yes, this is, uh, this is David Owens. Let me at least uh, uh, start responding to the question, uh, and Sherry can uh, spike in. So. Let me describe very briefly the characteristics of variable generation. As we, as I showed on one of the slides, where I showed a typical rooftop solar customer and how the utility grid is available 24-7 and how the rooftop solar facility is not available 24-7. So one benefit of the grid is that the grid has backup generation. So when that rooftop solar facility isn't there, that there are other sources of power supply that instantaneously become available from the utility to the customer. So when the customer flips the switch, the lights come on. The other thing that's very important, our grid has something called inertia. And that's the energy stored into the grid. So when you turn on your hair blower, your hair dryer, you notice that that hair dryer requires a lot of electricity. It's called surge energy. A rooftop solar facility cannot produce surge energy. It does not have inertia. There's something else, too. A, a rooftop facility, we have other characteristics of reliability. One of those are called voltage. You know that sometimes when you turn on your computer and you get a spike uh, and then your computer turns off, you, your surge protector is there. We have all those kinds of devices on the electric utility system. 
those are devices that we need to continue to install as we have more rooftop solar facilities. You also know, too, that a customer that has a rooftop solar facility is integrated into the utility grid. And so you want to make sure that you don't have that customer get in on the roof trying to adjust their solar panels and get electrocuted. So safety is also a very important responsibility. And we have standards that have to be met as we integrate rooftop solar facilities. So the nutshell is that the grid provides reliability, it provides resiliency, it provides assurance that all appliances can be operated efficiently because it provides a broad array of products and services that are available to the customer. Yeah, and on the other side of that issue, the benefits that DG provides to the grid, I think it really provides a benefit to the customers because, as David had said earlier, you know, it's giving a choice to customers. And, and customers more and more are wanting choice, whether it's the choice in their retail electric provider, the choice in their energy supplier, the choice in having clean energy. You know, those are all important issues that, that folks want to be able to, you know, exert their own choices on. Uh, it's also a clean energy source uh, to a certain extent. Uh, there are arguments on both sides of that. Um, there are people who argue that you know, the majority of those panels come from China or from another country where they might not have been manufactured in a clean way. So does that offset the cleanness of the actual solar panels? Uh, one of the challenges, I think, for solar is that it's variable in nature. Um, as most people know, solar peaks in the middle of the afternoon, and the actual demand on the electric system comes in the early evenings when everybody's coming home from work and turning on their ovens and their microwaves and fixing food for their family and preparing for the evening. So that variable nature is, is a problem for the utility and it's a problem for people who have solar rooftop TV because that's typically when they're going to need to rely on the grid to give them the extra energy that their solar is not going to be able to provide them. So until we actually see if the commercialization of battery storage and reasonable prices out there, um, there's going to be challenges for those with rooftop solar. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, what are the possible pros and cons of having T&D cost based on a per kilowatt and not as a fixed cost? Um, and then define the value of the grid, but I think we just kind of went over that pretty well on that second part. So let me, let me start, and then uh, Sherry does a great job of amplifying what I say. So the way that we currently price electricity, uh, we price it based on what we call volumetric sales. In other words, you get a per kilowatt hour charge. So the more energy that the utility sells, the more that they can assign some of the fixed costs. They can recover the costs associated with the grid, based upon the volume of sales that they make. So when the customer puts on a rooftop solar facility, that means that that customer is taking less power supply from the grid. Another way to say it is there's less total kilowatt hours that that utility is selling the customer. So if there's less total kilowatt hours, that means that there's less of a contribution towards the fixed cost of that grid. So what many state utility commissioners are doing is they're unbundling the rate. They're acknowledging that the volumetric approach is not the approach that will work successfully in the future. So they're separating out the variable costs from the fixed costs. They're separating out the fuel costs from the non-fuel related costs. And many states are moving in that direction. Some of the states are providing what we call minimum bills that every customer pays. And that provides a contribution toward that grid infrastructure. Other states are doing what we call charging a fixed charge rate. They're unbundling the bill. And much like I showed you earlier, they're saying 50% of the cost, 50 to 60% of the cost, are related to the grid. So you have to pay that 50 to 60% of those costs. So, for example, Wisconsin just made some decisions that provide for fixed cost recovery. Uh, Arizona also provided for some minimum contribution uh, for fixed cost recovery. I think it's $5 a month. 
In Wisconsin, it varies from utility, but on average, it's, it's $19 a month. So many states are looking at different approaches. But the fundamental issue they all concluded is that net energy metering at the retail rate does shift costs to non-DG customers. They also concluded you have to pay for the grid, and the grid needs to be modernized so it can take on all these new digital technologies, and that is expensive. Sherry? Yeah, I'm a homeowner, and I looked at purchasing um, solar panels for my home recently, and I'm not actually not in a net metering state, and the value just wasn't there for me currently. I mean, my biggest concern as an advocate would be to just the subsidies, the subsidization that the non-DG non customers are paying for the DG customers. I mean, when you can look at the US EIA data that shows you actually that 50 to 60 percent of every bill is fixed charges, and you know that the DG customer is getting the retail rate in those net metering states, that's concerning because you know that the utility is going to have to recover that amount of money for whether it's for infrastructure or generation or you know, distribution lines and the like, they're going to have to recover that in the rate case. And if they're not recovering it from the DG customers, they're going to recover it from everyone else. Um, they're going to recover it from those customers that can either least afford it, whether it's low income customers or seniors who are on a fixed income. They're going to recover it from folks who just don't want DG or just don't want to make the investment. So that's the real concern here is that those without the solar panels are going to end up subsidizing those with the solar panels. And, and it's a debate that's raging across the nation. And so I just encourage everyone to just kind of pay attention and determine what's best for you and your state and your constituency. Great. We have uh, time for one or two question, more questions. Um, so it's kind of a long question, but um, and you've already kind of addressed it, David, but have lawmakers or regulate publicly shown that any uh, concern um, the rooftop solar companies and businesses practices, Sherry, you addressed that component, but um, off of that, do you expect to see similar regulatory or legislative reforms of net metering in 2015 um, related okay. to kind of what skin let me, if I might, I'll start out. This is David Owens again, and Sherry always always does an outstanding job amplifying some of the points that I make. I would answer it in two parts. First, I think that there is a a uh, a pushback uh, from many solar uh, leasing firms who are very troubled that there is an increased recognition on the part of state agencies to make sure that this cost shifting does not occur in the future. And so what many of those firms are suggesting is that what you're trying to do is kill rooftop solar. And, and it gets to be extremely emotional, and it gets to be extremely political. There are personal attacks that are being made on public officials that have the courage to take on these issues and acknowledge that it's important to go forward with reforms. Uh, so 2015, in my view, will seek to be a very challenging year uh, because uh, there are those who would not like to see these reforms go forward. And they're very troubled that many states are beginning to address these areas with some level of concern and some level of passion and commitment. I also believe, too, that we need to, we're benefiting from the things that Sherry said, that not only is it an issue with respect to cost shifting, it's also a very important issue of consumer protection. So the states are becoming much more informed, and thanks to the outstanding work of Sherry and others, and they're becoming much more engaged. Uh, but I also think on the flip side, there are those who will challenge that engagement and who will try to frustrate forums to educate uh, consumers. Sherry? Yeah, I'm going to touch more on the business practice side of things, especially the rooftop um, third-party leasing companies, the solar leasing companies. There has been a lot of complaints nationwide. Um, Again, just a quick search of Better Business Bureau in your state will show you some of the kinds of complaints that are out there. 
Um, as I said, Washington State has already taken a proactive measure uh, with their uh, utility commission requesting guidance from the legislature. There have been several lawsuits that have been filed in Louisiana specifically related to some of the practices of these third-party leasing companies. Um, I, I had talked to a CEO of a utility a while back who, who said that, you know, again, these companies aren't informing them that they're even connecting customers to the grid. They're placing these rooftop solar panels on the wrong side of the house, the non-optimal side of the house to actually receive sunlight. Um, and they're just doing some really shabby installation jobs. Uh, there's also a, a, a lot of complaints about just the aggressive nature of some of these solar leasing companies and how they target communities or target specific demographics in trying to engage them into purchasing or, lease, I guess, leasing the rooftop solar. So it's concerning to me, just from a protection standpoint, especially since there does not appear to be a uniform outlet for people to complain about this. Um, I, I think people are going to start complaining more as solar becomes more prevalent. And I encourage the legislatures to look at this issue and determine where the best place for these complaints is going to be housed, whether it's at the Attorney General's office or the Public Service Commission or the Advocate's office, and also ensure the resources are there. Because when the complaints start coming in, they're going to need the people that can investigate, whether via phone interviews or in-person interviews, and actually understand what's going on in these communities so they can better go after the bad actors and you know, really look at the good actors and maybe provide recommendations or some kind of rating system to encourage those developers that are doing good business practices. Great. Thank you so much uh, for um, both of you for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule to, to present and to relay on some information. Uh, there was a few questions that we didn't quite get to, uh, but I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I will pass those along, and uh, we have that information. We'll get you back um, some uh, answers to your questions. But uh, just so you all know, we're going to um, this session was recorded, and we will uh, be putting it up online within uh, three to four days. It normally takes us to put that up. Um, and so you will all be receiving a link. And then also, uh, CSG has several um, publications about this topic specifically. And just recently, as last week, um, the southern region of CSG published a report on uh, the what states are doing in the South to address this issue and topic. And so we'll uh, include those links as well for you all to take a look at. But again, I just appreciate that all of your time, um, both presenters and pre uh, and participants. Um, I know you all are very busy. So um, thank you, and have a good day.